up and then talk a little bit to y'all. These notes are already on the web. So I want to talk about streams today. It will be the first of two lectures on streams continuing on Monday. And technically, these are finite streams today and infinite streams on Monday. Now, um, I want to show you streams because they're really cool. They're amazing things. But it has another context in this class, so, which is the notion of sort of practice. So you have seen MAP in lecture and also in section, and you've seen some of filter and accumulate, some in section. These are basic concepts in functional programming and higher order procedures. And from a practical point of view, I should tell you that no one these days ever writes a serial program anymore. All our programs are parallel and distributed. However, we don't usually teach you very much on how to write such programs. But if you use these kind of operators, map, filter, accumulate, and so forth, it turns out, given what you learn in CS230, especially by the end of the term, you'll be able to write almost any parallel and distributed program, even if there are millions or even billions of processors. So it's super important to a paradigm that's sometimes called functional programming and architecture it's called data flow. So I want you to see that. But the other thing is our lecture today has sort of a dual use purpose is that uh, we might like to ask you some questions on functions like map and filter and accumulate and so forth. And you have seen that some of those in lecture and certainly all of them in section, but this will serve as sort of a, some, a practice to uh, be able to reinforce some of those things. Now, Today, the difference is I'm going to define these functions on streams. And you don't know what those are yet, but I'll tell you. And streams are a little bit different from lists. They'll get increasingly different. So you certainly won't be responsible for streams on a midterm, but the list versions of these are extremely useful that we like to be able to ask you about them. Um, and so that will be some good practice. OK, back to the main topic of the class is where we're going with this is after we do finite streams today, we want to be able to talk about really large things like infinite sets. So we want to be able to talk about infinite sets, infinite series as first class objects. So you might have been surprised that you could write functions that would return another function. You may even have been surprised to regularly use functions that took another function as argument. And hence, you know, you are getting used to the idea that uh, all values in scheme are first class objects with all the rights and privileges of every other object. But in fact, we can go beyond that and we can have streams to represent very large objects, in fact, infinite objects, such as the natural numbers, the rationals, or even all the integers. And we can pass them as arguments and return them from functions and so forth. And this is an incredibly valuable paradigm. And of course, it's similar to what mathematicians do when they write a symbol, single symbol down for one of these things like the natural numbers. They're representing it as an infinite set using one symbol, and we'll have that same capability as well. But let's start out slightly slower than this as we, we think about it. I'm going to, you know, use the tablet and tell you about it. So the uh, Abelson assessment is particularly good on this subject. Please take a look. There's also quite a bit of documentation for Racket, and we've given you some code not only in how to use this, but how you might actually implement streams. So this is really a new topic area for y'all. It's a way of thinking about state. Now in CS, you might know, and if you don't know, you'll see it soon. There are all these techniques for handling what you might call local state. We don't really like global state, all these global variables, all around, but local state could, for example, be uh, local state variables in a procedure, right? Procedural abstraction hides those from the outside. You could even have a bank account with a hidden balance, and when you revisit it by calling the procedure, the balance changes. And of course, in object-oriented programming, which some of you have seen, you have instance variables of objects, and they change in order to correspond somehow or correlate with some kind of model. And finally, you might have seen mutable data structures, that is, data structures that can change through side effects or mutations. These are things like queues and heaps and so forth. We'll do a little bit of that later on in this class. Um, it's not functional, but incredibly important. It's a way of keeping state or changing state. So these are all pretty cool. They have the feel of real life, like the state is what you can see at the moment. And past states are just memories. You might be able to backtrace, but you can't really get there. And future states are completely inaccessible. There's a long essay by Vladimir Nabokov on this 
notion of the distinction of past to future that closely is mirrored by modern programming languages. So for example, we might think of writing some kind of code, like some code of some kind, might be an object-oriented framework where we are trying to model something like space travel. So, you know, in this paradigm, we might actually have a physical spaceship, right, of some kind. It might, you know, something like this is actually out there flying around. And we might want to do something with this object, like we might want to, uh, you know, make it go faster by changing its fuel. So we have this actual spaceship out there. And then we also have a computational object that's going to model this. And you might make this in our paradigm in scheme or an object oriented paradigm. You might say something like make spaceship like this. And that returns an object that is of type spaceship, it's an instance of spaceship, and changes in the actual spacecraft are reflected in the computational object and vice versa. Okay, so this is kind of a, a neat way to think about this. But, and this is pretty familiar, this is kind of like object-oriented programming or a lot of things you might have seen uh, or will see. But today I want to talk about a very different view of state. Um, and I want to give some examples to kind of motivate it that are really metaphors in some sense. And let me say that I tried for a few years to explain this using a metaphor that I like, which is thinking of a, a electric guitarist. So, you know, uh, if you play electric guitar, which I do, and many of you, some of you do, um, you know, it's actually pretty technical to play loud and clean and in public or in the studio. And there are all these boxes and filters and things between the guitar and the amplifier and the PA system. So there are filters and there are flangers and there are phasers and there's other filters and there's preamps and there's post amps and there's delay and all these boxes can be chained together and even if you have a modern setup with USB-C or something basically you have the notion of a bunch of boxes connected by wires carrying the sig signals and so forth and you can develop this metaphor for how you're going to do it and, and one of the things is that it's trying to make this facile so you can interchange the boxes in some fashion um, and still play music and concentrate on your art. But, you know, the fact is that one has to think about these things, and if you're going to play ear-splittingly loud rock and roll, for example, you need to understand the technology behind it so you can make it sound the way you want. But unfortunately, the example, while that tentacle tended to really excite about 2% of the audience, that is the people that play electric guitar and everyone else, even if they played an acoustic instrument like flute or cello, was like, yeah, well, okay, I'm not sure. So I would like to show you an example that's a little bit different and is a little bit legacy in the sense that it involves something more like CDs, which is something your parents might have used and you certainly worth knowing about CDs. Um, but it's, it's kind of a little more bit of a uh, accessible example than boxes of guitars using boxes, you know, effects you haven't heard of. So the example would be something like this. It's a bit, this view of, is a bit more like signal processing, right? And so in this view, if you, imagine these archaic CD players or something, they might work something like this. So on the left, you have some laser light coming in. So this is waves or it's particles if you want to be a quantum mechanic here. And then, you know, the CD player turns that into some other kind of waves, like it's not laser light anymore, it's some kind of electrical waves like this. The preamp makes that bigger and changes and so forth. The amplifier then kind of collects that together. And out here, you get your sound, which is music of some kind, right? So out here, you get something which is, you know, listable, notes at the other end. So this is kind of a signal processing view. So you can think of each of these boxes as something that takes an entire, you know, 72 minute signal. It outputs a different 72 minute signal that's a little closer to music. Or you can just look at what's there, you know, at each point in time. There are various, you know, ways of thinking about this process, but are these boxes going together? So we're gonna do something very similar. You know, have information flowing flowing through a collection of boxes, basically. And we look at some primitives to do this. Um, they're not primitives in the sense of uh, scheme primitives. They're like, like basic building blocks. But if you think about the steps here, we're gonna have something like enumerate that generates a signal. And then we're gonna have something like filter. We remove some signal values. We're gonna take map. So we're gonna turn one signal into something else. We're gonna take accumulate which turns a signal, which is a thing in time, into a scalar, which is some value or sum or integral of it in some sense. 
So again, the metaphor here is that the sound systems, stereos, all this kind of stuff for audio and even video, they're really great. They come in all these, have all these boxes and you can just hook them together in lots of useful ways. And this of course is the triumph of Bluetooth and USB and so forth. Um, you know, that's why they, they fit together so well because you could just hook, hook these things up. Um, we're not gonna do any electronics here, but that's the, the metaphor for doing this. So we've looked at some of these already. So you've seen map in lecture some, and you've seen accumulate, at least in section for lists. So here's the thing, streams are going to be similar, right? They're going to be actually, uh, um, you know, very, very similar in most ways. Uh, so initially, they're just going to be lists, which is actually, I think, kind of cool, right? So initially, these are going to be essentially exactly, exactly like um, lists. But then we're going to do something special to make them a little bit different. So you can think of them as lists initially. Now, one reason we want to make them different is in the next lecture, which is Monday, we're going to actually make these things be infinitely long. We'll have like a stream of for example, the integers, those couldn't fit in a list. So obviously these will have to be represented somewhat differently. But looking ahead to the sort of mathematics part, I mean, how would you make a stream of the natural numbers, right? Or how would you make a stream of all the integers that are both negative and positive, right? Or a stream of all the rational numbers, right? So the idea is that these will be objects that we can make that will be sort of list-like in flavor, and you can pass them around, and you can call them, you, you know, use them as arguments or return them from functions as well. And we'll answer these questions in the next couple of lectures. Okay, so think of lists initially, but we've got to change that for various reasons. Okay, so I want to motivate this by looking at a pretty standard piece of scheme code here. Uh, what this code is going to do is we're going to sum the prime integers between one and n. Fairly standard thing, I've got a helper function internally here with let rec. So I'm basically summing the numbers between one and n that are prime, all the prime integers between one and n. All right, so pretty standard. I think you could write this function. I think you could prove it's correct. I think you could use substitution model, all that kind of stuff. So when you think about what's really going on here, again, there are really four things, just like we had before. So first, we're enumerating the integers, you know, one to n. We're like generating those, that's the signal, so to speak. And then what we're doing is we're filtering out the prime numbers. We're deleting everything that's not prime. And then we're using map to turn that stream of prime numbers into the square of primes. It's basically, we're converting, we're squaring each of the selected numbers. And then what accumulate is doing is to accumulate the result into a scalar value using plus and starting from zero. So that's really what's going on in this piece of code here. But of course, it's, you know, it's, it's good code, but it's sort of hard to see that pattern in some sense. So streams make this, well, do several things. They make this apparent, but also they make it parallelizable and they, they make it work on infinite lists, which we won't see till Monday. So do realize that filter map and accumulate are already defined on lists we could make them generic so they worked on streams. Today we're going to define the stream version of these things. But here's the pattern in terms of boxes. Um, again, just as I said, n goes into a box called enumerate, which enumerates integers, filter, filters out, so we just get the primes. So at the, at the third arrow here, we just have prime, a list of a stream of prime numbers. Map turns each of the primes into the square of that number and accumulate sums them all together, starting with zero as a base case. So when you look at this code, it's pretty hard to see this pattern from the code. You know, everything is going on all at once. So we're gonna use streams to try to capture this picture. And for now, and this is wrong, but it's a good place to start, think of a stream as a list. It's not, but you know, it's a good place to get started. We'll correct that misapprehension shortly. Okay. So here are the operations on streams. So we have stream cons, stream empty, stream first, stream rest, and we have a contract. And notice this looks exactly like lists so far. 
like exactly the same as lists, except we have this thing called the empty stream instead of null, and these are named different things here. And the contract is exactly the same. Stream first or stream con of thing, stream gives you thing, and, and correspondingly for stream rest. So again, it looks like lists, but it's not eventually going to be lists. So now we can actually implement our procedure you know, using a bunch of little boxes. So I'm just going to write some code up. This is all on the web. It's actually already out there, so you can look at it. Um, I'll go through and explain it, and then we'll do some cool stuff with it. OK. So here's our box for enumerating, right? Fairly standard piece of scheme code. It takes a lower bound and an upper bound, low and high. And what it does is it basically makes a new stream. Again, think of these as lists that cons is low onto the recursive call to itself. So this just enumerates, like if you called it with arguments 10 and 15, it would produce the stream 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then it would return. So pretty standard piece of code to do this. So that will generate, so this, you know, we've implemented this part of the pipeline so far. Here we have uh, the ability to generate sort of a, a list or a stream of these integers. So given that, we want our program to actually look like this, this chain of black boxes. We don't want it to look like this because we can't tell what's going on. I want it to look like these black bo the boxes here where n goes into enumerate and so forth. And here's what that code would look like. So again, remember this is sort of top-down design. Remember, programs are proofs and proofs are program. What I'm doing here is I'm writing the code at the top level, and then we have to go write these subroutines. So, so far, we've only written enumerate interval. And finally, I also want to mention that um, from your point of view, you've seen accumulate, map, and filter defined on lists. I put an S on the end to, enumerate, to indicate the stream version, accumulate stream, map stream, filter stream, because the, first of all, they operate on a different type, which is streams. And when we standardize a part of the stream from a list, they'll have to be a little bit different. But I hope you'll agree looking at this that our box picture here in blue is exactly captured by the code below where we enumerate an interval, then filter the primes out, then map square, the square function over that, and then accumulate the results starting at zero using the binary plus operation here. So to realize this dream of these boxes, we just have to write um, the we have to write the rest of the functions. But basically, the idea is that a black box is then going to be a scheme function. Here are the blue boxes, but think black box. The blue box is a scheme function. One input, namely the stream coming from the left. One output, the stream going to the right. For all that, the last box, it's go, it's which is going to be a scalar because that's what accumulate does. It collapses the stream in some sense. Okay. Now, let me just mention a couple of things that will make our life a little bit more straightforward. So for historical reasons, there are multiple names for some of these accessors. This is for lists. And I want you to know that first and head are the same as car, tail and rest are the same as cutter. And the reason I'm mentioning that is that we want to carry over this metaphor to streams. So we'll generally have stream first and stream rest, but you could have tails and you could have heads. It could be a different term instead. These are exactly the same things, and I've actually indicated that by writing the code for it here. So head equals rest equals car, tail equals, sorry, head equals first equals car, tail equals rest equals cutter, just as we've done here. Okay, so let's implement some of these black boxes here. We need to define each one of these, and just like a list, the head of a list or stream is the first thing, the tail of a list or stream is the rest of the list. Again, think cutter and car for these. So here's what these start to look like. Again, they look a lot like the filter operation on lists that you've already seen. So filters works like this. I'm going to go briefly over it because you did it in a section. Filter stream takes a predicate and a stream. There's a base case. But basically, if the predicate is true of the head of the stream, then it stream cons is the first of the stream onto a recursive call to filter on the rest of the stream. Otherwise, it doesn't do that, it just calls the procedure um, filters recursively on the rest of the stream, thereby omitting this current element. So for example, a usage case would be 
if I had a predicate called odd, which I do in a stream S of numbers, filter stream odd on S returns a stream that has only the odd numbers in stream S. Now map, we've seen many times, here's map stream. So all I've done is change the type to stream. So it's exactly the same as map on list. So given this, we can say map stream square over S, this returns a stream of all the elements in stream S that are squared. Again, if you're thinking this looks like lists, it should, because it does. Okay, and finally accumulate. So again, we'll have lots of work with accumulate, but accumulate takes a binary function called a combiner. It takes a base case called a init, and it takes a stream. And what it does is it basically uses the binary function to uh, uh, sum up, in some sense, all the elements in the list. So for example, if the combiner function was plus and the init object was zero and the stream was integers, then it would sum up all the integers starting with a base case of zero. If the combiner function was multiply and the init function, init object base case was one and the stream was integers, then it would produce the product of all these elements in the stream. And you can see it doing this at the end, it's applying the binary operation here to the head of the stream and the recursive call to accumulate on the rest. So exactly like you saw accumulate on lists in section. Now some prime squares works exactly as diagram, namely these boxes in blue here. And just to, just to give you, just to bring it up again, here's the actual code that does that. So now we have implemented some prime squares here using this sort of data flow functional programming approach where we enumerate the integers one through n in a stream, then we filter out the primes, then we map the square function over those to square the rest, and then we accumulate the results with a binary operation plus starting at zero. This produces the square of the sum of the prime numbers between one and n. Okay. So where are we? So right now, it looks like we've just rewritten something we already knew how to do. Different way. We have this view of boxes, you know, processing the data, but why, why does it matter? So aside from parallelism, it's a powerful metaphor. So about 60 to 80% of scientific code is written in this fashion. And basically, if you ever use the Unix operating system, which by the way is on your Mac, old version of Berkeley Unix, the pipes that you can use to put things, but that's a, that's a version of this in some sense. So it's very similar to the uh, MapReduce paradigm for cloud computing. I'll give you a lecture on this, I think a week from today, so you can see how Map and Reduce are used. And just so you can um, make this have sense in your head, Reduce is another name for Accumulate. The theorists and the Google programmers like to say reduce better. So map accumulate or map reduce is a, basically a technique for parallel and distributed computing that uses what you know now. And it's used all over, basically all of tech uses this. And again, some synonyms, accumulate is also called reduce in some implementations. And in the CS community, sometimes called folder or fold write. So once you have a decent library of scheme functions, which I just you know, wrote for you, you can throw together fancy programs really fast. This is the, really the win of Unix and some other systems. And it lets you talk about computations over infinite data, which we're gonna do next lecture. So paid commercial advertisement, all our streams are finite in this lecture, but they will be infinite in the next lecture. So as uh, an exercise, uh, let me recommend that you try to write, accumulate, and also filter and map as higher order procedures simply on lists for practice and understand them. And if you can do that and use them, then you'll be in good position to understand how they work on lists, and then the generalization to stream will be fairly straightforward. Um, so we want you to be able to not only use these properly, but be able to write them. Okay, now, where are we? And let me mention again, when I say infinite objects, I want to be able to use a define statement and define 
the natural numbers, all the integers, the rational numbers, the primes. I want to make that a variable that is bound to a stream, pass it around, return it from functions, and so forth, and operate on it just like a mathematician would. So that's our, that's our goal. All right. Now, this is sort of a nice idea, but how does it actually work, right? And one way to, I think, bring you along in how this would actually work is to talk about a problem that we would have if we were to implement this just as lists. So if we were just to use lists, implementing streams would be very inefficient. So suppose I wanted the following query, and I mean that I put it in boxes here, but I mean this query in a mathematical sense. What if I want to know what's the second prime between 10,000 and 93 million? Perfectly valid question. And I decide to use it, I'm like, oh, Bruce did this great thing. I have these boxes, I have this functional programming. What I will do is I will just put two boxes together like this. I'll put it in enumerate box, followed by filter, and then I'm gonna get out the primes, I'll take the second one. So that seems like a kind of a really cool idea. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, here's the code for this. Nothing wrong with the code. So these, this code exactly implements the pipeline I have in blue there. Inside, we enumerate interval between 10,000 and 93 million. And then we filter that for primes, right? And then we take the second one. This is the, how we would say I want the second prime between 10,000 and 93 million. What do I mean by massively inefficient, right? Suppose I implement streams as lists, and I can do that just by defining type stream to be type list and all this code will run. So if I do that, I get something that is not, sort of not cool. What we end up having to do here is we create an enormous list that's almost 92 million long, right? It's actually 92 million, well, it's 92 million, long. So it's really, really long list of integers. We create this massive list. What we do is then we check them all for primality and we pick the second one. So this is, if you wanna waste time and work, this is a very impressive way to do it. It's probably the most singular way to waste time that we've seen, at least in this class so far. All right, so this is not a good way to implement streams. So we wanna do something different here, some clever thing that lets us keep our beautiful paradigm, but doesn't do something terribly inefficient. So we're going to use a common and very powerful idea in computer science. We're going to be lazy, but we're going to be lazy in a very particular way. And I hope you'll go back and talk to your roommates or your sweet mates or your parents or wherever you're around and tell them that I taught you how to be lazy today because um, they'll be surprised. So the idea of laziness is that at specified points in the code, we're going to return or deliver a promise to do something rather than actually doing it. And just like in real life, maybe no one will ever collect on that promise and we don't have to do the work. So the difference between streams and lists is exactly this. Remember a stream just like a list has a head and a tail or a first and a rest. So with a stream, the tail is not evaluated when you make the stream. It's only evaluated when you use it. So stream rest evaluates tails and stream cons doesn't. And this gives you many benefits. So let's contrast this with a list. So we have exactly the same contract as a list, but the evaluation happens at a different time. So stream first or stream cons x stream returns x but the stream object is not evaluated here when we do stream rest of stream cons of thing stream at that point we evaluate the stream so the way of thinking about this in a lazy sense is that when you make a cons a cons pair is exactly the same as before the head is going to be thing which is evaluated the tail is going to be oh, a promise to do it later if someone forces me to do it and the way to think about this is that in making that cons pair, Scheme is saying, I bet someone's going to ask for the head. So I'm going to evaluate that now and stick it in the car of the con cell. So. But for the tail, maybe no one needs it. Maybe they're going to be satisfied with, the, with, the, with 
just the head. And if they don't ask, I don't have to do it. So in other words, the cons pair, instead of looking like, you know, one and two, it looks something like one and then this strange object called a promise to evaluate two. And this is an evaluated object here of some kind. So I'm telling you what this promise is. So again, it hasn't evaluated, it promises to do it sometime in the future. All right, so how would you actually make good on this idea? So to reify this a little bit, I wanna tell you how we actually implement it, then I wanna come back to this example. So this is sort of the, my promise to you, although I bet you'll collect on it, after I define how to, what a promise really is, then we'll come back to this example and work it. First, I wanna tell you how we'd actually go about doing this. So come back to this. Okay, so to do this, we're gonna introduce a new special form called delay. Now, again, special form, not the usual evaluation rules. It's already in Scheme, it's there right now, but we'll show you how to use it. Now, you could define this using something called macros, which actually are in Scheme. In this class, we will not use macros. You'll see them just because I wanna show you for completeness. There are two reasons I don't want you to use macros. If you use macros, especially when you're just learning, then your code will be very hard to interpret and grade for us. Um, second, I do like Dr. Rackett quite a bit, but the real proper way to do macros is using something called hygienic macros, which were invented by my postdoc, Jonathan Reese. And uh, they're in the revised five through seven scheme reports if you want to look at it. So anything about how macros actually work are just for your edification. You might see them in a later class. We won't use them here. But I will tell you how this is actually implemented. So here's the basic idea. If I say delay stuff, that returns an object, but that object is a promise to evaluate stuff later when it has to. How do you do that? Well, you force it. If you have a thing of type promise, you call force on it and it collects on the promise. So here's an example that builds on something we did before. Suppose we define X to be the result of delay divided by one zero. This is not an error because what X is bound to is a promise to divide one by zero, but it hasn't actually divided one by zero. If we force X, at this point, we get the divide by zero error or bottom. So this looks a lot like functions, namely procedures of no arguments. Procedures of no arguments in computer science are called flunks. Great word. So look at our example here, define double X to be a procedure of no arguments, lambda nil, divided by one zero. That's not an error. Double X is the procedure of no arguments that when you call it will divide by zero, but until you call it, it's merely a procedure object. We get the error by actually calling it like this. So this suggests that delay could be implemented using lambda. This is one reason I showed you how cons could be implemented using lambda. Basically, if you have some weird thing you wanna do, or some useful thing or some trivial thing, basically almost always it can be done using Lambda. So it turns out Lambda will give us a way to uh, define promises and delays. Now, again, macros can do this, but don't worry about the details. I just want you to know that it's complete. The thing to understand is what's in this blue box, which is kind of rewriting. So delay X, where X is anything, is equivalent to Lambda nil X. So basically, if you're using substitution model, any time you want, or any time, actually you should, any time you see delay x, you can immediately just erase it and write lambda nil x. So what the macro does is it just rewrites it for you even before evaluation. Okay, and here's how you'd actually do it, but don't worry about the syntax of that. Okay, now it turns out force can just be defined as a regular function. So if I have a promise, and remember promise is essentially a thing of type procedure of no arguments, all I do to force something is call it. So this definition of delay and this de definition of force implements everything we have up to now. We haven't done streams yet, but we've been able to delay evaluation by encapsulating it in a lambda. lambda. Okay. Now that we have these, let's go back to streams. 
So stream cons is a special form too, because the special, the second argument is an evaluator. So in the same way that delay X is equivalent to lambda nil X, stream cons X S is equivalent to cons X onto delay S. Notice what's happened here. Just like I said before, the car of this con cell will be thing which is evaluated. The cutter of this con cell will be a promise to do stream later, namely the result of delay stream, namely it's a procedure. So if you think of what this looks like here, we'll, the con cell will look like this. Here we'll have actually X. So this is what we'll say cons X S. We'll return a con cell like this, and this will be a promise. I don't usually write this, but I will here. It will essentially be procedure of no arguments, right? That will return S, and this is evaluated, i.e. the result of evaluating lambda nil S. That's what returns this thing here. So you can see that the concrete types actually make sense here. You have a con cell whose head is some value that's evaluated, which is X. The tail is a promise conceptually. We actually have a type called promise. But in this example, it'll essentially be a procedure. It'll be the result of evaluating a lambda expression of no arguments. So the con cell's head is some value X. The tail is a procedure. So again, all you need to think about is equivalence. Stream cons X onto S is exactly equivalent to cons x onto delay s. So now we've delayed the tail. And of course, a macro can do this, but I'm not going to talk about that. Stream first is a regular function, exactly the same as head. And that makes sense. So I want to get x out of here. I just take the head. So that's going to be fun. All right, let's go on. Now stream rest also is going to be a regular procedure. So notice the asymmetry between stream first and stream rest. If you take the first of a stream, all you do is just look at the, use the data structure to get back the, the head. With the ret, stream rest, you get the tail and then you have to force it. So in other words, it's like you want to collect on the money and you go down to the bookie who owes you money and they don't give you the money, they just give you a promise. Then you have to force them to collect on it. So we call the force function, which is defined up here. So basically objects look like in this picture here. The head is an actual value, the tail is a promise. Okay. So this delayed evaluation here is gonna give us, we can think of it as demand driven computation. The metaphor you might think of is, is kind of like pulling a string through a bunch of holes and you just get as much as you want. It's, it's more, more like this than pouring water through. So you pull string and you're gonna get as much as you want, you don't get any more. Okay. So that's how we'd actually implement streams. We use promises and promises are implemented by the special form delay. And you can see the delay is implemented using procedures of no arguments. Okay, now let's go back to our concrete example here. We want to get the second prime that is between 10,000 and 93 million. And we have this nice form here which says, stream first to stream rest of filters prime numerary interval. So from inside out, we would be enumerating the entire interval of integers between 10,000 and 93 million. Filters nominally would check each one of those for primality and only give you the prime ones back. Then you would take the tail of that stream and, and take the first item in that tail. A lot of work. So how could we do this in such a way as to eliminate some of that work? So let's talk about what would actually happen here. So all I'm really going to be doing here is drawing con cells like this in order to illustrate this example where I have the head being a value and the tail being a promise. So let's go down and try to do that. I have some text here that also explains it so you can come back to this. All right. So this is a little busy, but we've seen all this before. So on the left, we have our code for enumerate interval and filters. Why? Because in my box diagram, I have enumerate going into filter. And of course, in my scheme code, I have filters calling enumerate intervals. So that's all the code that we need. And again, remember our contract for streams, exactly the same as for lists, but the evaluation happens at the different time. When you make a stream with stream cons, 
the tail is not evaluated. It's only evaluated when you call stream rest and the tail is forced. So let's try to work this example and understand a little bit about why we don't have uh, some terrible long, long computation here. So let's look at what is returned by numerate interval here. So again, numerate interval is going to call stream cons here, right? We see that. Here's our stream cons. So that tells us this is going to be represented as a stream. So the value of a numerate interval 10,000 to 93 million is going to be something like this. So the head is going to be 10,000. And the tail is going to be a promise. Promise to, I'll use EI, enumerate interval. I'll just call this thing here EI. From 1,001, 10,001, sorry, to uh, 93 million. And just to make sure we really have this, you know, understood what these things are, I'll draw a box around this to indicate that it is evaluated. And then just for consistency, we'll put a box around this guy here. Okay. All right. So this is what enumerate interval returns. It just returns a con cell. The head is 10,000. The tail is a promise to enumerate interval 10,001 up to 93 million when we're asked to do it, right? So what happens next? Now we have to look at filter. Well, filter looks at stream first of stream, of the stream, right? That's what it's gonna do here. And it applies the predicate, which is prime, and 10,000 is not prime. So we do the next clause, the else clause here. The else clause, what does it do? Basically, the else clause forces the tail, which does the ne next enumerate interval. So basically here, we're going to call stream rest on this object here. Stream rest forces to the tail, and the enumeration continues. So you only get another thing from the stream when you explicitly call stream rest, which forces the tail just once, right? So for everything you get out, you have to call a force, which you get from the stream rest. And that's why we can very quickly, once we've done delays, we'll get the second prime number between 10,000 and 93 million, and it won't enumerate beyond that. So by putting in delays, essentially making lists lazy, that's how programmers say this, making lists lazy in this sense, we only do as much computation as we have to. So in fact, it will only enumerate up to the, uh, the second, the, the, the second prime that we're going to get there, which is going to be great. All right. So that's our example of how we do, how we solve that problem and how these things work. All right. A lot going on there will give you lots of practice. Okay. Now. Maybe we can pause for a question here. Absolutely. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. So why does the whole tail not get forced when you call stream rest? Because it only forces one thing, one thing. So think of how, think of what this is gonna look like. We're gonna build this thing, you know, basically we all, we don't, there is, is no more. So if we, let's, let's say we do stream rest here. Uh, great question, by the way, I just wanna help work, work it with you. So let's look at, we're gonna do stream rest applied to this object. And we agree that's what we're gonna do because that's what is gonna happen here, right? So what happens when we, when we do stream rest? Let's look at what stream rest actually looks like. So I have to scroll back up here. So what stream rest does is it forces the tail. And let's try to keep in mind what it means to force a tail. When we force a tail here, all we do is we call the function. So we have to get down to the representation. So another way of thinking of this beast here is as follows. We get that promise by the following thing. Lambda of no arguments. The 
enumerate interval, 10,001 up to 93 times 10 to the sixth. Now, why do I say this? Because that's how this dream is made. Look where this arrow is. So the call that made this tail that we're looking at in the box was called with low equal 10,001. Sorry, it, I'm sorry. It was made with low equal 10,000 and plus low one will be 10,001. So this call here with the arrow, stream cons 10,000, enumerate interval 10,001, 93 million, results in this object here. So basically what we've done is we've done, uh, you know, the stream, result of stream cons was, you know, cons 10,000 onto that. So this is what made this object here. Let me stop and say, does that make sense? I mean, I haven't explained everything yet, but does that make sense how we got that object? Yes. Okay, let's just evaluate it a little bit further. I mean, so all I have to do here, I mean, to make you sort of comfortable with this is I just have, want to evaluate the lambda and that will be proc, oh, sorry. Hmm. Sorry. So the 10,000, the 1,000 here, 10,000, sorry. The 10,000 here evaluates to this 10,000. The lambda is an expression that evaluates to this. And for now, I'm just implementing promises as lambdas of no arguments. So in, in the, what this means, this is an equality sign here. So this means that the head is the 10,000, the tail is just a procedure object. And so it only gets evaluated once. So then you enumerate this interval, uh, you, when, you, when you're forced to do it, what happens then is that uh, you're gonna call enumerate interval. But if you look at how enumerate interval works, the recursion is stopped with another stream cons, right? So the second time you'll get another stream there, which is fine, but it's, the tail is gonna be delayed. So it aggressively delays until you ask for it. Did I help an answer your question? Yes. So, but then does that just mean that the, the only reason the whole tail isn't being forced kind of is because we call stream cons again within the enumerate function? Yes, that's correct. And will that always be the case? Uh, well, if it's not the case, then you'll have an infinite loop when you try to make the thing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you, you, what, you're, what you're asking is a really great question. This isn't an, an idiom for making streams. And here we're making them with the help of a procedure, like a numerator interval is a procedure that makes it a stream, which is kind of cool in a way. But you could also, as we'll see next time, define recursive streams. So you don't actually need the procedure for a lot of these things. Okay. Great question. Any more questions? Um, I have one quick question. Um, yeah. Isn't delaying and quotation kind of similar in a sense? Because we described quotation earlier as just stop, like stopping the uh, evaluation and delay here is also just essentially stopping the evaluation until it's needed. Yeah, there's some similarity there, but they're not equivalent. Um, and uh, one reason is that um, when you, I mean, th there are two reasons, both of which are fairly deep, but let me just gloss over them. So the first is that if you have variables in your quoted expression, imagine some carefully quoted thing. And suppose you pass that around in your different environments, suppose you have an X in there. Well, what is X bound to? Like, is X in the global environment? Is it in the local environment of your procedure? I mean, it's not really well-defined. 
Lambda, on the other hand, uses lexical scoping. So even if you have lets and variables and let recs inside your lambda, the meaning of all the variables inside there is defined by the substitution model, and it makes total sense. Whereas quote kind of depends on what kind of scoping is being used. So that's one reason we prefer lambda here. The other is that this notion of lambda is kind of an approximation, and I'm going to show you that next a little bit, but we might want to use something a slightly more powerful version. They'll still use lambda. I'm going to use something that is more powerful than what I've showed you, still uses lambda, and I wouldn't know how to do it with quotes. Um, and if that sounds mysterious, I hope to explain that um, after your question. But I think you could sort of see that if you were just to quote something that had variable names in it, you might ask what scope, where would it look up those variable names? Like, would it be in the place where the quote was defined? Like, you know, if you were to say, let X be quote a bunch of stuff, you pass X a bunch of places. Well, if there are variable names in there, where, where were they defined? So the scoping isn't as clear in some sense. But the real benefit is that I can do some other things for efficiency if I allowed to have the full force of procedures in here. That makes sense. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Great question, by the way. All right, so let's do a little bit more. So this example calls involves memoization. Now, I always have to ask, have you heard of this before? Did they do a little of this in 201 or something like that? I'm not gonna rely on that. I'm just curious who's seen the term memoization before. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you've seen it somewhat. So. This is a technique we can use. I want to come back to this. So there's one more inefficiency possible here. And this inefficiency comes from what happens if we're implementing delay as a function of no arguments as above. And this really fits very well into the previous question we had, right? Um, so what happens if you need the same element multiple times, right? If that's the case, then each time it's computed anew. So if you need to call the stream repeatedly to get the 50th element, you have to kind of do all that work again. So what we imagine doing, or actually do do, and we have put code on the web already for this, is what we do is we memoize the function to avoid this expense. And the way of thinking about this is that if we have a function, say f, we would like it to remember the pair x f of x if it was asked, if f was called on x and returned f of x. So, you know, f starts out, it knows nothing, but then, you know, someone says, you know, Carolina says, hey, I want to pass you in two. And it says, oh, f of two is 17. But then it should remember that if then someone else calls, if Vikram calls and says, I want to know, know that, you can look it up at a table. So it can remember this pair x, f of x, and it can just look it up the second time, third time, fourth time it's called. So essentially the Procedure is memoized, which means it will have state, which allows it to keep a growing table of all the values it was called with before and the values it returned. So instead of computing them, it can just return them. This is kind of a pretty cool idea. And let's see how that would work in our example here. And I've written this out in text, but I think it's a little easier to see. So here's a slightly different example from our, you know, second prime between 10,000 and 93 million. It's a little more reasonable kind of mathematically. Suppose we wanted a stream of prime numbers, all the prime numbers starting at one and going to 93 million. And again, we started with low and high, and then <clears throat> you know, we filter it with prime and get prime numbers and so forth. And this is a great construct that works really well because you know, maybe the person doing this only wants the first 50 of them and only goes up to 50 primes, which would be kind of nice. But here's how, if you don't have memoization, this could be, you know, sort of an issue, is that, um, you know, the following scenario is, we define primes here, which of course is a variable, and this is pretty cool, we have a stream that's a bound to, you know, a variable here. Suppose we pass primes, this variable to some function, say f, and f needs the first 100 primes. 
And suppose subsequently we pass this same primes variable to some function g, and g only needs the first 101 primes. Then as we've implemented this now, g will need to recompute the first 100 primes plus one more, which is a big waste of work because computing primes is a little bit non-trivial. So the memoized version is gonna start off just like we did before, but it's kind of gonna keep track. So here's what you think about this. So here's the memoized version of primes. After executing this statement, the variable primes is gonna be bound to a console that looks like this. Yes, I'm gonna say one is a prime because I'm really an 18th century mathematician. Again, let me just mind you, this is evaluated. All right, so after we do this defined statement, primes is actually bound to this object here, just like before. And that's why, you know, we haven't done much work by doing this, we've just made a cons pick basically, right? So remember, we now pass primes to f. So we say something like f of primes, and who knows what f does, but it returns with a value. And I've told you that F needs the first 100 primes. So the problem is if I then want to pass this to G, G would have to recompute all those 100 primes just to get 100 first. So what we can imagine doing with memoization is something like this. <coughs> After F returns, we can imagine primes being bound to something that looks like this. So the idea is that after we have, um, you know, after we have called F, now primes could be bound to this instead. So basically it keeps a list of prime numbers that it's already computed. Right, so it remembers what the stream did before. So now if we wanna call a new function g and arguendo g needs only the 101st prime, then all g needs to do is traverse this list here all the way down to the end. Then what it needs to do is it needs to do stream rest on that list and return the result. So it needs to just get all the way to the end without doing any computation, just follow towards the end. Then it takes this object here and it does stream first of stream rest of that thing and it's done. So, you know, list is a kind of table basically, right? What we've done here in memoizing streams is we've described a setup where the stream primes can remember what it has been enumerated to before. So again, there's a question of what is f? f is a hypothetical function that needs the first 100 primes. And g needs the 101st prime, and we would like to have g avoid doing all that work. So if after f returns, or while f is running, primes keeps track of how far it's enumerated, and only has the promise at the end where no man has gone before, then when we call G, G needs, merely needs to go down to the hundredth prime and then go one more. So this is a technique called memoization. 
and it's uh, pretty neat. So basically, there is uh, some code that shows you how to do this, and there's some subtle issues that we can get into. Let me just mention a couple of those because we have a few more minutes. So if I do this scheme of keeping a table of what I've enumerated before, it takes more space. In fact, it takes a linear amount of space, right? So the way we describe this in computer science is we say there's a space-time trade-off. So one of the beautiful things about primes when it's unmemoized is that it will run really very quickly. So actually it requires only constant space, but recomputing the stream takes order p time, where p is the hundredth prime. On the other hand, if we save all those things, then we use order p space, but recomputing them only takes order p time. And the reason this is in important is that there aren't really that many primes. So roughly, the way to think about this is as these numbers get bigger, is that if you want the pth prime, they basically are only a logarithmic number of these. So we can save a lot of time by storing these primes, but we also have to use some space for this. So the main thing, I mean, you can work out what these details are, but the main way to think about this is that in the unmemoized version of this, we're not recording any state at all. And therefore, if G wants to recapitulate the work that F already asked for, that work has to be done again. If we record where we've been enumerated to before, that requires linear space to store it, but we get a big saving in times, in time the next time, because we can just look it up rather than enumerating out there. And the savings actually is slightly larger than you might think. So, you know, in this scenario, P is the hundredth prime, right? But P is not a hundred. The hundredth prime is fairly far out there. So roughly the ratio between these things is sort of logarithmic. Um, this comes from the, basically the, Uh, Georg Friedrich Bernhard Riemann proved this, um, but there are other proofs of it too. Uh, so the thing is that the hundredth prime is actually a fairly big number. It's roughly the case that you can think of as, um, you know, log p is around 100, approximately speaking. This approximation gets bigger as it gets lar larger. So the way to think about this is that clearly the amount of space I need for memoization is going to be order in this case, um, you know, order 101, whatever that number is. Let's call that M. So we need to, you know, the, the number of primes we're storing up here. So we don't need that much space here. But the amount of work we save is really exponential in that. It's really quite a bit of work. Now, and that's because we have to to get at the hundredth prime, we have to enumerate a lot of things that aren't primes. So in this case, the trade-offs are probably worth it. We save a lot of time versus space, depending on the application. But there are other cases where we save even much more. And there's some examples that we're, we will give you, or maybe even have already given you about Fibonacci numbers. The Fibonacci numbers, if you do that in an unmemoized fashion, you will do exponential work. But if you do it in a memoized fashion, it takes linear time. So memoization, extremely clever way, essentially what you need to know as a computer scientist is that with memoization, what we're doing is we're finding ways where we're basically just trying to um, store, we're just trying to store what the function did before. So in our case here, here's what I was looking for. I'm sorry for the scrolling. Basically, the, the key concept is if you have a function and it's called on value x, returns f of x, it remembers that, and in the future can look it up. One way of reifying this or instantiating it is what we saw in this case here. Namely, 
we can imagine prime starting out as a single con cell, but as we force the tail, instead of just returning the value, we create a longer list. And that longer list is a record of what the stream did in the past. And since everything's functional, it'll never change again. So in short, if we didn't have memoization, function f needs 100 primes, function g needs the 101st prime, function g has to redo all that work because the streams have no memory and the functions have no memory. If we memoize the streams, and this is one example of how to do it, the first 100 things here will be the first 100 primes in this list, and the tail, or rather the last thing in this list, will be a promise to enumerate more things. If function g wants the 101st prime, it merely traverses the list with 100 cutters. When it gets down to the end, which has a prime const onto a promise, it forces that promise with stream rest, then takes stream first to actually get the number out and returns. So it needs to do one force and one significant computation. The cost though is that to do that requires this amount of space. You have to store 100 primes, but you save time because you just really need to traverse it. Okay, more spectacular with Fibonacci. So with that, I want to say that I've given some text to this to try to explain what I did. I think it's easier to hear it, but I've written this down so you can look at it in the notes. Let's talk about the big points today. So what are streams? They're like lists, but they delay their tails. You only evaluate the tails when necessary. How do you delay something? Well, delay returns a promise to do something later. You can implement it with Lambda and maybe some other ways. There have been some good suggestions about that. When do you do that? Only when forced. So stream rest forces the tail. Stream cons delays the tail. Every delay has to be undone with a force. So if you've done cons up a bunch of stuff, there's a delay for each cons of the tail. You have to do a force to get rid of each one and get into that. And again, just as we had with lists, we have stream operations that are defined on streams. Map, filter, accumulate are defined on list. Stream versions, which I've called here maps, filter, accumulates. These are actually available to you usually in Racket as you know, stream map, stream filter, and so forth. We'll probably write our own for many purposes like this. So these are very cool. And with this, we can have finite lists and we can have all this efficiency. The reason this is super cool for a class that has a mathematics component is that I can actually use these to have a large number of um, elements, even an infinite number. I see there's a question from Michaela. 